Michael says, Well, I've lost my job, or Clavikin replies. The position that Sir Alfred Walter made for you, Michael says, I'd stuck it for two years, and deadly dull it was, Lord Clavikin says. Every job is dull, nine-tenths of the time. Michael says, I need something much more stimulating, Lord Claverton says. Well, Michael says, I want to find some more speculative business, Lord Claverton says. I dare say you've tried a little private speculation. Michael says, several of my friends gave me excellent tips. They always came off. The tips I didn't take, Lord Claverton says, and the ones you did take, Michael says, not so well for some reason. The fact is... I needed a good deal more capital to make anything of it. If I could have borrowed more, I might have pulled it off. Lord Claverton says, borrowed from whom? Not from the firm. Michael says, I went to a lender, a man whom a friend of mine recommended. He gave me good terms on the strength of my name, the only good name that has ever done me. Lord Claverton says, on the strength of your name? And what do you call good terms? Michael says, I'd nothing at all to pay for two years. The interest was just added onto the capital, Lord Claverton says. And how long ago was that? Michael says, nearly two years. Time passes pretty quickly when you're in debt, Lord Claverton says. And have you other debts? Michael says, oh, ordinary debts. My tailor's bill, for instance. Lord Claverton says, I expected that. It was just the same at Oxford, Michael says. It's their own fault. They won't send in their bills, and then I forget them. It's being your son that gets me into debt. Just because of your name, they insist on giving credit. Lord Cliverton says, and your debts? Are they the cause of your being discharged? Michael says, well, partly. Sir Alfred did come to hear about it, and so he pretended to be very shocked, said he couldn't retain any man on his staff who'd taken to gambling, called me a gambler, said he'd communicate with you about it. Lord Claverton says, that accounts for your coming down here so precipitously in order to let me have your version first. I dare say Sir Alfred's will be rather different. And what else did he say? Michael says. He took the usual line, just like the headmaster, and my tutor to Oxford. Not what we expected from the son of your father, and that sort of thing. It's for your sake, he says, that he wants to keep things quiet. I can tell you it's no joke being the son of a famous public man. You don't know what I've suffered working in the office in the first place. They all knew the job had been made for me, because I was your son. They considered me superfluous. They knew I couldn't be living on my pay. They had a lot of fun with me. Sometimes they'd pretend that I was overworked when I'd nothing to do. Even the office boys began to sneer at me. I wonder I stood it as long as I did, Lord Claverton says. And does this bring us... To the end of the list of your shortcomings? Or did Sir Alfred make other unflattering criticisms? Michael says, well, there was one thing he brought up against me, that I'd been too familiar with one of the girls. He'd assumed it had gone a good deal further than it had. Lord Cliverton says, perhaps it had gone further than you're willing to admit. Michael says, well, after all, she was the only one who was at all nice to me. She wasn't exciting, but it served to pass the time. It would never have happened if only I'd been given some interesting work. Well, in some ways you want someone relaxing. Lord, Claverton says. And what do you now propose to do with yourself? Michael says. I want to go abroad, Lord Claverton says. You want to go abroad? Well, that's not a bad idea. A few years out of England in one of the vineyards might set you on your feet. I have connections or at least correspondence almost everywhere. Australia? No. The men I know there 
are all in the cities, and outdoor life would suit you better. How would you like to go to Western Canada? Or, what about sheep farming in New Zealand? Michael says, sheep farming? Good lord, no. That's not my idea. I want to make money. I want to be somebody on my own account. Or Clivedson says, but what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? What kind of a life do you think you want? Well, perhaps learn to live on your own means. Um, in the meantime, you know. Michael says, I simply want to lead a life of my own, according to my own ideas of good and bad, of right and wrong. I want to go far away, to some country where no one has heard the name of Claverton, or where, if I took a different name, and I might choose to, no one would know or care what my name had been. Well, part of that's being a sociopath, and part of that's being a psycho. Uh, Lord Claverton says, well, I mean, there's part of it that's not. Lord Claverton says, so you are ready to repudiate your family, to throw away the whole of your inheritance. Michael says, what is my inheritance? As for your title, I know why you took it, and Mother knew. First, because it gave you the opportunity of retiring from politics, not without dignity, being no longer wanted, and you wish to be Lord Claverton, also to hold your own with Mother's family, to lord it over them, in fact. Oh, I've no doubt that the thought of passing on your name and title to a son was gratifying, but it wasn't for my sake. I was just your son. That is to say, a kind of prolongation of your existence, a representative carrying on business in your absence. Why should I thank you for imposing this upon me? And what satisfaction, I wonder, will it give you in the grave if you're so conscious after death? I bet it will be a surprised state of consciousness. Poor ghost, reckoning up its profit and loss, and wondering why it bothered about such titles. Uh, trifles, Lord Claverton says. So you want me to help you escape from your father? Michael says, and to help my father be rid of me. You simply don't know how very much pleasanter you will find life become once I'm out of the country. What I'd like is a chance to go abroad as a partner in some interesting business, but I might be expected to put up some capital. Now, the president that we have in my country, at least as I'm making this, um, you know, they criticize him for his son, but he's aided and abetted his son knowingly set things up so it's not quite the same thing. Lord Cliverton says, what sort of business have you in mind? Michael says, oh, I don't know. Import and export. With an opportunity, a profits both ways. Lord Cliverton says, this is what I will do for you, Michael. I will help you to make a start in any business you may find for yourself. If on investigation, I am satisfied about the nature of the business. Michael says, anyway, I'm determined to get out of England. Lord Cliverton says, Michael. Are there reasons for you wanting to go beyond what you told me? It isn't. Manslaughter? Michael says, manslaughter? Why manslaughter? Oh, you mean on the road? Certainly not. I'm far too good a driver. Well, people aren't far too good a driver to be, um... To have an accident, you know? Um, it's possible with everybody, I would think. Lord Cliverton says, What then? That young woman? Michael says, I'm not such a fool as to get myself involved in a breach of promise suit or somebody's divorce. No, you needn't worry about that girl or any other, but I want to get out. I'm fed up with England. Lord Cliverton says, I'm sure you don't mean that, but it's natural enough to want a few years abroad. It might be very good for you to find your feet, but I shouldn't like to think that's what inspired you was no positive ambition, but only the desire to escape. Same thing goes with religion and other things. You, it's got to be something other than an escape. Um, Michael says, I'm not a fugitive. Lord Clavison says, no, not a fugitive from justice, only a fugitive from reality. Oh, Michael, if you had some aim of high achievement, some dream of excellence, how gladly would I help you, even though it carried you away from me forever, to suffer the monotonous sun 
the monotonous sun of the tropics, our shiver in the northern light. Believe me, Michael, those who flee from their past will always lose the race. I know this from experience. When you reach your goal, your imagined paradise of success and grandeur, you will find your past failures waiting there to greet you. You're all I have to live for, Michael. You and Monica, if I lived for 20 years, knowing that my son played the coward, I should merely be another 20 years in dying. Michael says, very well, if you like, call me a coward. I wonder whether you would play the hero if you were in my place. I don't believe you would. You didn't suffer from the handicap I've had. Your father was rich, but was no one in particular. So you'd nothing to live up to. Those standards of conduct you've always made so much of. For my benefit, I wonder whether you always had lived up to them. Monica had entered unobserved. Monica says, Michael, how can you speak to father like that? Father, what has happened? Why do you look so angry? I know that Michael must be in great trouble. So can't you help him? Lord Clavigan says, I'm trying to help him and to meet him halfway. I've made him an offer, which he must think over. But if he goes abroad, I want him to go in a very different spirit from that which he has just been exhibiting. Monica says, Michael, say something. Michael says, what is there to say? I want to leave England and make my own career. And father simply calls me a coward. Monica says, father, you know that I would give my life for you. Oh, how silly that phrase sounds. But there's no vocabulary for love within a family. Love that's lived in, but not looked at. Love within the light of which all else is seen. The love within which all other love finds speech. This love is silent. What can I say to you? However Michael has behaved, Father. Whatever Father has said, Michael, you must forgive each other. And you must love each other. Michael says, I could have loved Father if you wanted love, but he never did, Monica, not for me. You know, I've always been very fond of you. I've a very affectionate nature, really, but... And Miss Cargill enters with a dispatch case. Miss Cargill says, Richard, I didn't think you'd still be here. I came back to have a quiet read of your letters. But how nice to find a little family party. I know who you are. You're Monica, of course. And this must be your brother Michael. I'm right, aren't I? Michael says, yes, you're right, but... Miss Cargill says, How did I know? Because you're so like your father when he was your age. He's the picture of you, Richard. As you were once. You're not... To introduce us, I'll introduce myself. I'm Maisie Montjoy. That means nothing to you, my dears. It's a very long time since the name of Maisie Montjoy topped the bill in review. Now, I'm Miss John Cargill. Richard, it's astonishing about your children. Monica hardly resembles you at all. But Michael, your father has changed a good deal since I knew him ever so many years ago. Yet, you're the image of what? He was then. Your father was a very dear friend of mine once. Michael says, Did he really look like me? Miss Cargill says, You've his voice and his way of moving. It's marvelous and the charm. He's inherited all your charms, Richard. There's no denying it. But who's this coming? It's another new guest here. He's waving to us. Do you know him, Richard? Lord Clyburn says, It's a man I used to know. Miss Cargill says, How interesting. He's a very good figure, and he's rather exotic-looking. Is he a foreigner? Lord Cliverton says, He comes from some place in Central America. Miss Cargill says, How romantic. I'd love to meet him. He's coming to speak to us. He must introduce me. Gomez enters and says, Good morning, Dick. Lord Cliverton says, Good morning, Fred. Gomez says, You weren't expecting me to join you here, were you? You're here for a rest cure. I persuaded my doctor that I was in need of a rest cure, too. And when I heard you'd chosen to come to Badgley Court. I said to my doctor, well, what about it? What better recommendation could I have? So he sent me here. Miss Cargill says, oh, you've seen each other lately. Richard said, Richard, I think you might introduce us. Lord Cleverton says, oh, this is, uh, Gomez says, your old friend, Frederico Gomez, the prominent citizen of San Marco. 
That's my name, Lord Cleverton says. So let me introduce you by that name to Miss... Miss... Uh, Miss Cargill says... Miss John Cargill. Gomez says, We seem a bit weak on the surname stick. Miss Cargill says, Well, you see, Senior Gomez, when he first became friends, Lord Claverton and I, I was known by my stage name. There was a time once when everyone in London knew the name of Maisie Montjoy in review. Gomez says, If Maisie Montjoy was as beautiful to look at as Miss Cargill, I can well understand her success on the stage. Miss Cargill says, Oh, did you never see me? That's a pity, Senor Gomez. Gomez says, I lost touch with things in England. Had I been in London and in Dick's position, I should have been your most devoted admirer. Rather shallow things to admire, but... Um, Miss Cargill says, It's too late for you to love me. That's the song that made my reputation, Senior Gomez. It will never be too late. Don't you agree, Dick? This young lady, I take to be your daughter. And this is your son, Lord Cliverton says. This is my son, Michael, and my daughter, Monica. Monica says, how do you do, Michael? Michael says, how do you do? Miss Cargill says, I don't believe you've known Lord Cliverton as long as I have, Senior Gomez. Gomez says, my dear lady, you're not old enough to have known Dick Ferry as long as I have. We were friends at Oxford. Miss Cargill says, oh, so you were at Oxford. Is that how you came to speak such perfect English? Of course I could tell from your looks that you were Spanish. I do like Spaniards. They're so aristocratic, but it's very strange that we never met before. You were a friend of Richard's at Oxford, and Richard and I became great friends not long afterwards, didn't we, Richard? Gomez said, I expected that was after I had left England. Miss Cargill says, of course, that explains it. After Oxford. I suppose you went back to, where's your home? Gomez says, the Republic of San Marco. Miss Cargill says, went back to San Marco. Senior Gomez, if it's true you're staying at Badley Court, I warn you, I'm going to cross-examine you and make you tell me all about Richard. In his Oxford days, Gomez says, on one condition, that you tell me all about Dick when you knew him. Miss Cargill says, pats her dispatch case. Secret for secret, Senor Gomez. You've got to be the first to put your cards on the table. Monica says, Father, I think you should take your rest now. I must explain that the doctors were very insistent that my father should rest and have absolute quiet before every meal. Or Claverton says, But Michael and I must continue our discussion this afternoon, Michael. Monica says, No. I think you've had enough talk for today. Michael, as you're staying so close at hand, will you come back in the morning after breakfast? Lord Cliverton says, yes. Come tomorrow morning. Michael says, well, I'll come tomorrow morning. Miss Cargill says, are you staying in the neighborhood, Michael? Your father is such an old friend of mine that it seems the most natural to call you Michael. You don't mind, do you? Michael says, no, I don't mind. I'm staying at the George. It's not far away, Miss Cargill says, and I'd like to walk a little way with you. Michael says, delighted, I'm sure. Gomez says, taking a holiday. You're in business in London, aren't you? Michael says, not a holiday, no. I've been in business in London, but I think of cutting loose and going abroad. Miss Cargill says, you must tell me all about it. Perhaps I could advise you. We'll leave you now, Richard. Au revoir. Monica. And Senor Gomez, I shall hold you to your promise. Miss Cargill and Michael exit. And Gomez says, Well, Dick, we've got to obey our doctor's orders, but while we're here, we must have some good talks about old times. Bye bye for the present. And leaves. Monica says, Father, those awful people, we mustn't stay here. I want you to escape from them. Lord Cliverton says, What I want to escape from is myself, is the past. But what a coward I am to talk of escaping. And what a hypocrite. A few minutes ago, I was pleading with Michael not to try to escape from his own past failures. I said I knew from experience. Do I understand the meaning of the lesson I would teach? Come, I'll start to learn again. Michael and I shall go to school together. We'll sit side by side at little desks and suffer 
the same humiliations at the hands of the same master, but have I still time? There's time for Michael. It is too late for me, Monica. Act 3 is in the late afternoon of the next day. Monica seated alone, and Charles enters and says, Well, Monica, here I am. I hope you got my message. Monica says, Oh, Charles, Charles, Charles. I'm so glad you've come. I've been so worried and rather frightened. I was exasperating that they couldn't find me when you telephoned this morning that Mrs. Pickett should have heard my beloved's voice, and I couldn't just when I had been yearning for the sound of it, for the crest that is in it. Oh, Charles, how I wanted you. And now I need you, Charles says, my darling. What I want is to know that you need me. On that last day in London, you admitted that you loved me. But I wondered. I'm sorry. I couldn't help wondering how much your words meant. You didn't seem to need me then. And you said we weren't engaged yet. Monica says, we're engaged now. At least I'm engaged. I'm engaged to you forever. Charles says, there's another shopping expedition we must make. But my darling, since I got your letter this morning about your father and Michael and those people from his past, I've been trying to think what I could do to help him. If it's blackmail, and that's very much what it looks like. Do you think I could persuade him to confide in me? Monica says, Oh, Charles, how could anyone blackmail father? Father of all people. The most scrupulous, the most austere. It's quite impossible. Father with a guilty secret in his past? I just can't imagine it. Well, everybody has guilt and shame and to work with. Certainly he has fears. Um, but yeah, that's not really what's going on from what we see. Um... Claverton has entered unobserved. Monica says, I never expected you from that direction, Father. I thought you were indoors. Where have you been? Lord Claverton says, Not far away, standing under the great beech tree. Monica says, Why under the beech tree? Lord Claverton says, I feel drawn to that spot. No matter, I heard what you said about guilty secrets. There are many things not crimes, Monica, beyond anything of which the law takes cognizance. Temporary failures. Irreflective aberrations, reckless surrenders, unexplainable impulses, moments we regret in the very next moment, episodes we try to conceal from the world. Has there been nothing in your life, Charles Hemington, which you wish to forget, which you wish to keep unknown? Charles says, there are certainly things I would gladly forget, sir, or rather, I, which I wish had never happened. I can think of things you don't know yet about me, Monica, but there's nothing I would ever wish to conceal from you. Lord Claverton says, If there's nothing, truly nothing, that you couldn't tell Monica, then all is well with you. You're in love with each other. I don't need to be told what I've seen for myself. And if there's nothing that you can conceal from her, however important, you may consider it to conceal from the rest of the world. Your soul is safe. If a man has one person, just one in his life, to whom he is willing to confess everything, and that includes, mind you, not only things criminal, not only turpitude, meanness, and cowardice. Well, if it's something that would elicit a uh, criminal punishment, um, it's, it's not, you know, we're supposed to even be able to testify against our own self, that sort of thing. Um, we don't want to die with that on our conscience, really. Um, Unatoned for, etc., if it's mere statute stuff or whatnot, that's that's a different story. But if it's something that spiritually is, and the state has a physical punishment for it, um, I mean like death penalties and floggings and that sort of thing. Not, you know, if the penalty's off, then I understand that too. I would keep a secret fam family maybe too with that. Um, but also situations which are simply ridiculous when he has played the fool as who has not. And I'm not saying I would either. Um, then he loves that person, and his love 
will save him, but I'm afraid I've never loved anyone, really. Nor do I love my Monica, but there is the impediment. It's impossible to be quite honest with your child if you've never been honest with anyone older on terms of equality to one's child. One can't reveal oneself while she is a child, and by the time she's grown, you've woven such a web of fiction about you. I spent my life trying to forget myself and trying to identify myself with the part I'd chosen to play. And the longer we pretended, the harder it becomes to drop the pretense. Walk off the stage, change into our own clothes, and speak as ourselves. So I'd become an idol to Monica. She worshipped the part I played. How could I be sure that she would love the actor if she saw him off the stage, without his costume and makeup, and without his stage words, Monica? I've had your love under false pretenses. Now I'm tired of keeping up these pretenses, but I hope that you'll find a little love in your heart, still for your father, when you know him, for what he is. The broken down actor, Monica says, I think I should only love you the better, father. The more I knew about you, I should understand you better. There's nothing I'm afraid of learning about Charles. There's nothing I'm afraid of learning about you. Charles says, I was thinking, sir, forgive the suspicion from what Monica has told me about your fellow guests. The person who, she says, claim a very long acquaintance. I was thinking that if there's any question of blackmail, I've seen something of it in my practice at the bar. I'm sure I could help. Monica says, Oh, Father, do let him. Charles says, At least I think I know the best man to advise you. Lord Claverton says, Blackmail? Yes, I've heard that word before, not so very long ago, when I asked him what he wanted. Oh, no, he said. I want nothing from you except your friendship and your company. He's a very rich man, and she's a rich woman. If people merely blackmail you to get your company, I'm afraid the law can't touch them. Charles says, Then why should you submit? Why not leave badly and escape from them? Lord Claverton says, That's because they're not they are not real, Charles. They are merely ghosts, specters from my past. They've always been with me, though it was not till lately that I found the living persons whose ghosts tormented me to be only human beings, malicious, petty, and I see myself emerging from my spectral existence into something like reality. 